or even the common grace of the beautiful day today, the, the warmth of the sunshine that's going to get even warmer in the next couple of days. Thank you for preparation of our hearts for Resurrection Sunday and all that we will do in God-exalting worship to uh, thank the God who raised his son from the dead uh, on our behalf, the first fruits of our resurrection. Uh, meet with us now as we study your word. Might it edify us and even help us in preparing uh, a biblical argument to those that are inquiring about how we got here. Uh, we'll be cautious to give you all the praise in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, and join me in Genesis 1, and once you find Genesis 1, keep your finger there and, uh, and go over to Psalm 14 as well. Two passages we want to tie together, have our biblical foundation for our uh, explanation of biblical creationism and how we got here. In the first chapter of the Bible... We read in verses 26 and 27 God's account of how we got here. Genesis 1:26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, over in Psalm 14, God tells us that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together, they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. I know that puts a wallop to your whole self-esteem, but in our culture about the uh, uh, man being born a blank slate and the inherent goodness of man, uh, God says uh, from, from the womb to the tomb, there is no goodness in us. And the foolishness in our heart is not an intellectual issue. It's a spiritual issue. Possibly no subject has been more widely debated than the question of man's origin. So the debater over inerrancy has rightly included a discussion concerning the historicity of the Genesis account of creation. It is the eternal word. Jesus says, heaven and earth shall not pass away. This is of the eternal God from everlasting to everlasting. This, this book that we just read from is truth itself. Thy word, Jesus says, is truth. What it says on any issue, we can trust even creation. Taking the word by faith of the only one who was there at the creation of it all. We don't have to be timid or hesitant about believing the Bible. You take a, another book, say a 1930s science textbook, compared to today, it's almost ridiculous. Things have been changed, discoveries have been made which showed that we didn't know everything in the 1930s. Wouldn't it be foolish to trust an ever-changing science text for answers to life when there is a never-changing, no updates, no need for editing, infallible Bible that we can depend upon. With it, you can answer the question, how did man first appear on earth? Because God doesn't leave us in the dark. How old is man? About five days younger than the earth. Spurgeon said, the worst sort of clever men are those who know better than the Bible and are so learned that they believe that the world had no maker and that men are only monkeys with their tails rubbed off, unquote. Even better, the psalmist tells us that it's only fools who reject 
God from the equation. In 1831, the MS Beagle began its five-year voyage around the world, and one of its passengers, a young English naturalist named Charles Darwin, took his first steps towards writing what he himself would later call the Devil's Gospel. During the journey, Darwin observed plants and animals at various ports of call, and based on those observations, concluded that the diversity of living things was not the work of an infinitely intelligent and all-powerful creator, but the result of a process that he called natural selection. In 59, Darwin published his gospel in a book titled Origin of the Species. In it, he argued that all life descended from a few primitive organisms that every living thing, including human beings, evolved from a common ancestry. Darwin's new theory was a hard sell. The scientific community of his day, which believed in divine creation, largely rejected it, and the religious community declared him a heretic. One of Darwin's principal supporters, biologist Thomas Huxley, described the climate this way, quote, the supporters of Mr. Darwin's views were numerically extremely insignificant. There is not the slightest doubt that if a general council of the church scientific had been held at that time, we should have been condemned by an overwhelming majority, unquote. And Darwin's detractors weren't the only ones to doubt evolution. Darwin himself struggled with it at times. In the sixth chapter of Origin of the Species, he stated, quote, long before having arrived at this part of my work, a crowd of difficulties will have occurred to the reader. Some of them are so grave that to this day I can never reflect on them without being staggered, unquote. Later on in the book, he concedes that the eye could evolve by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. <laughs> in his chapter on imperfections in the geological record, he complained that the lack of evidence in the fossil records was perhaps the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. And you want us to believe you? <laughs> of course, those objections eventually disappeared by the turn of the 20th century, evolution had gained almost universal acceptance without the scientific, within the scientific community, acceptance that eventually found its way into the culture at large. Philosophers pondered evolution, authors wrote about it, statesmen began adhering to its principles, and if you attended school in the last 40 years, you probably learned it in the classroom. Today, evolution is widely accepted as fact, Open a lot of your, or maybe we say most, science textbooks, and you'll read about mankind's kinship to monkeys and apes. Visit most natural history museums, and you'll hear how life first appeared on earth billions of years ago. In fact, in an August 23rd issue of Time magazine, featured a cover story titled, How Man Evolved. Seems the more important question, did man evolve, no longer bears asking. The near universal shift from belief in creation to belief in evolution has had a devastating effect. If we believe human life is the product of chance, how can our lives possess true meaning and purpose? If instead of being created in the image of God, we were spawned in some primordial soup, how can our lives possess any dignity in the first place? And if we believe nature operates on the principle of survival of the fittest, that we are nothing more than the next rung on the evolutionary ladder, how can our lives possess any true value? Indeed, that kind of thinking has laid the groundwork for some of the darkest chapters in the 20th century history. During World War II, Adolf Hitler played out the evolutionary theme of survival of the fittest by massacring millions of people in an attempt to weed out the weak and pave the way for the master race. That kind of thinking has led to similar attempts at genocide in the Soviet Union, Cambodia, Yugoslavia. 
Yet the world continues to embrace evolution. We ask the question, why? The answer is simple. People buy into evolution because they love their sin. That's the theological and accurate answer. As long as they deny God as creator, as long as they cling to the notion that life appeared on its own, they can also deny God as judge. And without a righteous judge, they're free to continue sinning without guilt or fear of consequences. So on one level, unregenerate man's willingness to believe evolution makes sense, doesn't it? If you were lost in your sins, if God had not revealed Himself to you and delivered you from wrath, wouldn't you look for a way to convince yourself that He didn't exist? Wouldn't you be willing to cling to anything that can absolve you of your guilt and calm your fear, even if it's untrue? Sadly, though, unbelievers aren't the only ones buying into Darwin's theory. A lot of believers today mistakenly try to fit evolution into the Genesis account of creation kind of merge in the two. Some believe in theistic evol evolution, the notion that God played a part in evolution, that He initially created the universe and then let evolution run its course. Others adhere to progressive creationism, the belief that creation occurred over millions of years, that God injected Himself into the process and did some creative work over that time. But both theories are deadly because they undermine the veracity of Scripture. The Bible's clear. We don't believe what Genesis says about how God created the universe. At what point do we start believing the Bible? Like, like the Bible I was teaching out of last week that has the first several chapters of Genesis literally falling out. Where do you kick in? If God's Word is less than true in Genesis, how can we trust the rest of it? In short, we cannot believe in hybrid theologies like theistic evolution or progressive creationism and maintain the integrity of Scripture. So we're left with two choices. We believe what Genesis says about creation of life and the universe, or we don't. Either we believe the Bible or we believe evolution. We cannot believe both. The truth is we don't need to equivocate when it comes to creation. Science cannot prove evolution, nor can it disprove creation. The idea that life evolved from common ancestry is pure fiction and imagination. It's a lie designed to eliminate God and at the very least undermine the integrity of His Word. So when the church makes room for any part of that lie, it aligns itself with the enemies of God and it yields ground without cause. Certainly, thinking correctly about creation is vital to our understanding of God, the universe, and ourselves. It forms the foundation of God's Word and serves as the anchor of our spiritual lives. And yet, for many believers, Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27 that we read together, remains one of the most mysterious, misunderstood, and misinterpreted chapters in all of Scripture. So appreciative for those that, you know, Ken Ham wrote a book entitled The Lie. Dr. Bill Barrick, Old Testament professor for several years in a seminar, Cutting It Straight, Genesis 1 and 2, writes, quote, Bible students must be aware that the biblical record differs greatly from the theory of evolution. If the text of Genesis 1 is accepted as historical narrative, it is not consistent for someone to say that he or she believes that God used the process of evolution to create all things. First of all, evolution requires billions of years to accomplish its program. Secondly, the process of evolution is based upon mere chance alone without any guiding intelligent being. And thirdly, the order of evolution totally contradicts the order presented in the biblical record of creation. It's all or nothing. Biblical creationism or evolution. And after what I know is, yes, a rather lengthy introduction, the very missing link. They suggest Man was formed after simple types of life change to more complex types throughout millions of years. But 
what about partial transformations? That's the question I've got tonight. We'd naturally expect to find hundreds, even thousands of examples of skeletons which are, say, reptiles half-changed into birds or animals half-changed into men. Wouldn't you? But not one undisputable example can be found. Oh, I guess there was the example in 1953 which was named Piltdown Man. Remember, learned about Piltdown Man? had part of a human skull and part of an ape's jawbone after being hailed as great discovery by multitudes of wise scientists he was revealed as a hoax bones had been chemically treated to give appearance of age so much for the very missing link john phillips asks nine questions when he writes Man is in no way related to the beast. Here's his questions. Think, think about these with me. Number one, what animals can transmit accumulated achievements from one generation to another? What animal experiences a true sense of guilt when it does wrong or has a developed consciousness of judgment to come? Thirdly, what animal shows any desire to worship? What animals have hope of immortality beyond the grave? What beast can exercise abstract moral judgment or show appreciation of the beauties of nature? Sixthly, what animals ever learn to read and write to act with deliberate purpose and set goals and achieve long-range objectives? What animal ever learn to cook its food, to cut cloth and make clothes or invent elaborate tools? What animal ever enjoyed a hearty laugh, and ninth, what animal has the gift of speech? Even the most primitive human tribe possesses linguistics of a subtle, complex, and eloquent nature. You know, just a private antidote, you know, we were, for the last week, my bride and I were watching one of my boy's dogs while he was on drill, and my wife was determined to teach this mutt a few things. He learned to shake. He learned to sit for his treats. He learned to go to the door, to go out. This is all in just a week. And he's been back home for a few days and he's lost everything that he learned. But if I were to say to Thor, yeah, that's his name, Thor, go down to the garage and get the, uh, the yellow hammer in the second drawer. No, you can... You can train them, but they cannot think and follow complex instruction. It might have been in your resource recommended list last week, I don't recall. John Whitcomb, one of the kings of biblical creationism, in his book, The Early Earth, writes about only man. Only man is self-conscious as a person is able to exercise choice and have purposes and goals in life, possess an emotional capacity for sadness and joy, appreciates art and music creatively, can imagine and then manufacture real tools, can be truly educated rather than merely trained, can use oral and written symbols to communicate abstract concepts and thereby enjoy fellowship. Only man can accumulate knowledge and attain wisdom and move beyond what he was making and seeing progress. Only man can discern more right and wrong and suffer from an offended conscience, can be held accountable for his deeds, reckoned guilty and judged, can recognize the divine authority of his creator and honor him properly. So I'd suggest to the evolutionary theorists, there is a very missing link that they have to own up to. Let's bring another opposition. How about the second law of thermodynamics? As observed today, everything in the universe is slowing down. For example, take the sun. 
It's using up vast amounts of energy every second and isn't being replaced. Given enough time, the sun would burn out like a lantern's wick out of fuel. Many in our day, want, uh, without God, want to save the earth, don't they? They ought to read 2 Peter 3, 1 to 7 to see what God's going to do on it all. You know, and so I say, use your aerosol, aerosol can, stomp on the grass, and kill a deer, you know. Uh, our, our, but uh, second law of thermodynamics. How about friction? Oxidation. All of that makes sure our cars end up on junk heaps and barns eventually age and sag and homeowners attest to the rotten trim boards that get replaced and the expansive roofs get replaced. People are born, grow old and die, bodies simply run down and stop. Like a huge clock, the universe has been wound up and is running down. You cannot refute the second law of thermodynamics. You know, when I was in door-to-door sales as one of my many jobs, uh, I would, you know, in trying to dismiss people's tools that they have about these tools I'm trying to sell them, there is this thing of planned obsolescence. You can go back to that photocopier in the office there and pull that apart and see that the gears that are running it are made of plastic, not of metal. So it'll wear out. Is it gearing up and improving or wearing out like a rag? This is why Jesus says, store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts and where thieves cannot break through and steal. The world's not our home. We're just passing through. Third opposition. How about the how of life's beginning? In their formula, you take mutations plus natural selection times time, a whole lot of time, you've got evolution. Mutations, natural selection, this is a formula. For a, for a group that usually requires logic, step-by-step explanations, science, scientists become very inexact when speaking of this. They usually, the spiel goes something like billions or trillions of years ago, certain chemicals happened to join together under certain conditions and life was formed. The scientific name for that is spelled L-U-C-K. Luck. We got lucky and got life. And they laugh at us who take the Bible for God's Word. How about the problem of given enough time, anything, even evolution can occur. That's why it takes millions and billions of years. Got another problem here. Is this, uh, this ought to be no- problem number four, right? How about the interdependence of plants and animals? Let me just give you one specific example. The yucca plant and moth. In his excellent booklet, Problems of Evolution, Dr. Stuart Custer presents the case of the yucca plant and the yucca moth. The yucca plant found in the southwestern U.S., is fertilized only by the yucca moth. None of the other insects bother with the yucca plant. In fact, the larvae of the yucca moth bother to eat only the seeds of the yucca plant. Without the aid of yucca moths, fertilization, the yucca plants in the southwest would die out. Without the food provided by the yucca plant, the moths would die out. Evolutionists can't answer these questions. How did the yucca plant evolve without the aid of the yucca moth? And second question, how did the yucca moth evolve without the food from the yucca plant? Answer, as I open my Bible to Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 29 and 30, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was 
so. Genesis 1, 29 and 30. The greatest problem is spiritual, not intellectual. Like we could pose several other difficulties for the evolutionist just from a scientific viewpoint, but the greatest is spiritual, not intellectual. Bottom line of evolution, faith. You got to believe it. In the final analysis, one must believe evolution just as one must believe creation. It's a religion. Those who disbelieve the Bible account of creation do so willingly in their unbelief, according to 2 Peter 3. Those who accept only natural processes as cause for the world and man merely prove that they are unsaved natural men, 1 Corinthians 2.14. They're really saying there is no God, that's Psalm 14. I don't want this Jesus Christ ruling my life. You see, if God really created this world and man and sent Jesus to die for the sins of mankind, then all of us face judgment. Wicked, sinful man would rather explain the universe without a God to whom they must be accountable. God's view? Creationism. Bible is the sole basis for truth, not science. We'd suggested Hebrews 13 or, or 11.3 11, uh, 11, last week. It's an issue of faith. This is the hall of fame of faith, Hebrews 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What are our presuppositions? That the Bible, number one, is the sole basis of truth. Only found there. What science gives cannot be accepted as absolute truth. Genesis records facts, not myths or legends, because the origin of man is a natural subject for human inquiry and speculation. Those who have tried to answer the question apart from the Bible have made numerous attempts. Only in Scripture can one expect to find complete and an accurate account. It is true that the Bible is not a science text, but that doesn't mean it's not accurate when it reveals truth belonging to the arena of science. Science may contribute to our understanding, but it must never control or change our interpretation of Scripture in order to accommodate its findings. No subhuman creatures were involved no, is any process of evolution. So presupposition number one, the Bible is the sole basis for truth. And number two, faith, Hebrews 11, 3. Since there were no human spectators at the beginning, and since the first man was placed in an already existing universe, we must accept what God reveals by faith. Otherwise, we can know nothing with certainty. To be an evolutionist, you have to dissolve truth. It actually takes more faith to believe that this world just happened than to believe in God's creation. It also takes more faith to believe in evolving of one species from another with its total lack of supporting proof than to believe God said, let there be, and there was. You know, the, the Word of God in discussing the flood of Genesis 6 and the, and the unsaved men says, according to 2 Peter 3, 5 and 6, for this they are willingly ignorant of the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The simple truth is that wicked men have rejected God's way and have gone on in their spiritual blindness, hoping to explain away God, and yet they never do. You've got some other recommended resources uh, to uh, add to your library. Um, I know some of you are, have a, a couple of years on me, and so there's no way that you can say that you don't know about the Dear Abby column in the old-fashioned newspaper we used to read. The Dear Abby column 
written by Abigail Van Buren, published a poem many years ago that I clipped out. It was entitled, The Monkey's Disgrace. Here's the monkey's disgrace, according to Dear Abby. Three monkeys sat in a coconut tree discussing things as they are said to be. Said one to the others, now listen you two, there's a rumor around that can't be true, that man descended from our noble race, the very idea is a great disgrace. No monkey has ever deserted his wife, starved her babies and ruined her life. And you've never known a mother monk to leave her babies with others to bunk or pass from one on to another till they scarcely knew who is their mother. Here's another thing a monkey won't do. Go out at night and get on a stew or use a gun or club or knife to take some other monkey's life. Yes, man descended the honorary cuss, but brother, he didn't descend from us. And a much more astute theologian than Dear Abby. One of the resources I think I recommended last week was uh, Dr. MacArthur's book on the battle for the beginning. In that, as he leads us into amazement and worship and doxology to the doctrine of creation. He says, the more man delves into the universe, the more amazing and awesome the wonder of creation becomes. Telescopes can take us some 4 billion light years, that's about 25 sextillion miles into space, and yet we have not come near the edge of the universe. We've discovered certain gravitational principles that keep the stars and planets in their orbits and, what you, we, and yet we are far from fully explaining those principles, much less duplicating them. The earth spins on its axis at a thousand miles an hour at the equator, travels in a 580 million mile orbit around the sun at about a thousand miles a minute and with the rest of its solar system careens through space at an even faster speed in an orbit that would take billions of years to complete. The energy of the sun has been estimated to be equivalent to 500 million million billion horsepower, if you can factor that in. There are at least 100,000 million other suns in our galaxy, most of them larger than ours. God is also our creator and sustainer of the microcosm. A teaspoon of water contains a million, billion, trillion atoms, which themselves are composed of still smaller particles of energy. Smaller subparticles of those particles are still being discovered. You see, science, in the light of theology, leads us to worship. We know Jesus Christ upholds all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3. He energizes every atom, every atomic particle and subparticle in the universe. That is the power of our God and Savior. And if he has power to create and sustain the earth, surely he's got power to recreate it. He's got the power to bring back Eden and indeed create a new earth that far surpasses Eden. And we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Spurgeon says, these men have such wonderful theories that it really seems surprising that they do not themselves make a few worlds since they profess to have found out so many ways of making them. Let us pray. Father, help us never to doubt in the dark what you've revealed in the light. Thank you for the word of God, your self-disclosure, using words that are clear that we can understand in their normal sense. You've told us everything that we need to answer the questions about life. And so God, help us to hold up your authoritative and inerrant word to lead us into worship of our creator and redeemer and to have a biblical apologetic of how man got here according to your words, not ours.
We'll pray, we pray this in the name of Jesus, our sustainer. Amen. Yes, sir.